George Washington, if you love a little history of this country and a love affair, you're going to love this conversation with Mary Calvey, CBS anchor this morning news. Her story in its own right is amazing because of where she started. Besides the fact that she went to Syracuse. If you're from Syracuse, you'll love this story. Go Cues. And um, by the way, tell me where you're from, like what part of the country. I've been trying to navigate where you're from. If you're from particularly outside the country, you could be getting a special gift. So just email in where you're from. And we'd love to hear from where you're from. So just click in there below. Tell us the state, city, some unusual location where you're at, anything that's kind of cool and different. We'd love to hear from you. We're talking with Mary Calvey. The book is Dear George, Dear Mary. It's a little history about George Washington you're going to be very interested in finding out about, and it's a little bit about a love affair. Yeah, it was right. pretty remarkable. I was really stunned when I found this information, and I couldn't believe that it hadn't been told before. So it was just finding document after document, and they pieced together like this massive puzzle and showed this story of love, deception, and vengeance. Love, deception. This sounds very like a movie. It was intriguing. It was Could really this be a movie? It, it may be. I don't know. What I, got you on this? Like, I, I, that's what I was, I was like, wow. So like what? I mean, I always watch you in the morning, and I've watched you many years on the weekends, and I always trust you with my news. But... How does this come about? So t tell me if you've done this before. You were a kid, you know, traveling with a, a school visit or what have you. And for me, I was um, in Yonkers where I grew up, my hometown, and had gone to see this beautiful old manor, knew that a very wealthy family had lived there in the 1700s. And so it always stuck with me that there was a young woman who lived there named Mary Phillips. And uh, it just kind of the curiosity hung, hung on uh, for a long, long time. And when my husband was inaugurated as mayor in Yonkers just a few years ago. Your husband's the mayor the of mayor Yonkers. The mayor in our hometown. So you, you, you were born and raised in Westchester. That's so right. you have some political yes, stuff. Yes, that's right. Keeps yeah. that flowing. Absolutely. So he wow. was able to become the mayor in our hometown, which was really exciting. And he had his inauguration at Phillips Manor, this beautiful old home that I was talking about, which was appropriate because it was the original city hall. But 100 years before that, it was the home of Mary Phillips. So I say to my husband, you know, Maybe we should find out about that local lore that George Washington once courted Mary Phillips. It had hung around for a long, long time. No one knew for sure. And he said, that's a great idea. But did he? So I thought, let me start researching. And did you find I what you were looking for? I couldn't believe what I found. Because I thought I would find, oh, yeah, maybe they had a date or two. It was much more than that. I went back to really? some of the old biographies. But was George so married at that time? This or? was George in his 20s before Martha. Okay, before, there was Mary. Okay. And so this was one of the biographies I found. This is from the 1800s. A historian wow. named Henry Cabot Lodge. How, you know, being a collectible guy, like, how yes. hard is it to find this book? It was hard to find some of these, I'll be honest with you. I went back to some of the collectors. Um, and on um, page 96 of that book, Henry Cabot Lodge, who had a PhD from Harvard, said that Washington fell in love with Mary Phillips. So this is where I'm starting from. Not only did he talk about her, but historian after historian, Washington Irving in the 1850s said that, that he was an open admirer of Miss Phillips was historical fact. And so I thought, I'll start here. And so maybe a dozen biographies in the 1800s about Washington mentioned Mary Phillips. and. Pretty much everyone that I could find has her mentioned. And so that's where it began. Wow. And so I went back to some of the beautiful archives, and cool. um, there's even an image of the two of them together that was created in the 1800s for an article that that's I cool. also had to obtain the original publication for <laughs> because I couldn't find it anywhere else. This is um, oh a magazine from the 1800s. I thought you might like How that. hard to get something like this? This took me a long while <laughs> to track this one down. Exactly. This expensive one, to buy or yeah some of them were uh, a bit expensive yeah some of them some you know in in the hundreds over 100 years yeah. old yes yeah so uh, i handled them with care and i felt like it was quite the treasure now, and woodrow what, wilson what, what, wrote what, an article what this. Did, is that what woodrow wilson was yeah or what mm -hmm. did he say he said that washington um admired her greatly and he didn't leave without a sharp rigor at his heart meaning that he was really interested in Mary Phillips, but let me say why. Is first, she was this beautiful heiress, but she, I think, was the richest single woman 
in colonial America in the really? 1750s. So she owned 50,000 acres of property at the time. And this was in New York. So we're talking Harlem, north, through the Hudson Valley, all along the Hudson River. Her family owned hundreds of square miles of property. And so she was the catch. Now, the interesting thing is as he's courting Mary Phillips, there were a number of other men who wanted to court Mary Phillips. Now, Washington back then was a colonel in the British Army. And I found that there was this amazing list of suitors. And I realized that as Washington was courting this heiress, his commanders in the British Army also wanted to court her. Oh, boy. And so she was a hot number. Absolutely. To and say the least. They wronged him. They kept him away from her, I believe. They didn't give him the proper promotion that he rightfully deserved. They kept him in enemy territory with not enough weapons, not enough men. So that Left they would him there have to her. die. I think so. In the end, they also launch a smear campaign of sorts. A scathing article comes out in the papers in the 1750s, just blasting Washington, claiming debauchery, gambling, womanizing, goes on and on, comparing him to like- You think he was like, a womanizer? No, I think it was all false, falsehoods, really? absolutely. I think it was a scathing article and it was wrong, and I, it was written anonymously. And so I had to do this research to figure out who actually wrote the article, and I believe the man who wrote this article, the man who wronged him, the man who wouldn't give him leave, the man who wouldn't give him promotion, and the man who ultimately moved in on the girl, are on this list of potential suitors and also his British commanders. So we have a Washington in his 20s that goes from willing to give his life for the British Army to despising the British Army. It's as clear as day when you look at his letters. And so here I am wow. finding this information saying, wait a minute, why am I finding this information? Hasn't anybody else said this before? So I went back into history to figure that out and I really couldn't find this full story anywhere. So I think that's why we're sitting here talking today. Now, was there any possibility that those two were ever going to hook up? Did that ever, did that possibility ever kind of? Oh, so he, George Washington spent about a month in New York at courting Mary Phillips. Left, came back because she was agreeable to another interview, as they called it. Now we call it date. Okay. And, um, I don't know what they call that now. So, yeah, 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 that's true. What do we call it now? It was a date. Uh, could have yeah. been a hookup. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, so they had some time together, and it was about a course of two years that I believe that they were an item uh, wow. in history. Mm -hmm. But no shot that the, the marriage or that was going to go further. What, what do you think stopped it? What, so what, what I believe being betrayed by his commanders uh, is what did him in. Um, in the end, Mary ended up marrying one of the men that's on this list of potential suitors who she had no interest in initially, but she waited quite a long time, I believe, for Washington to come back for her. And he just didn't. And I believe he actually did, but at the point that he did, um, she had already signed the legal documentation to marry another man. Wow. And a prenup, in fact, at the time. So she kept her property and uh, she kept her um, home. What did well. you find out about George Washington? <gasps> at the, did you, find, you know, just some of the just underlying stuff about you know one, one obviously one of the most famous great presidents of our of our time. So, I think that Washington has so much of a story to tell that I think has been never hasn't hasn't been seen he was passionate he wrote love poems in his journal he was a man who would dance all night so that every bell had a chance to to dance with him they wanted a touch of him and he was quite the stud at handsome the time. guy absolutely in his, in his time in his time yes no seated portrait of washington exists when he was younger than in his mid-40s i believe so george washington's mount vernon came up with what they believe he looked like and yeah he was a handsome guy and he was really a romantic too and where'd you find out about the romance any good romantic stories there oh he, he writes her? such beautiful he writes so eloquently there is a love letter that is um been very interesting in history and in it Washington says um, calls himself a votary of love he says I feel the force of her amiable beauties and the recollection of a thousand tender passages I mean this is George uh, Washington do you feel like do you feel like some of that kind of romance is gone oh I think that you have is to it getting really lost? I think it might be I think we need to get back to Washington's time and, and what he was like in his 20s and willing to speak of his emotions and write love poems in on paper I mean he was so remarkable and that time in history um, 
I think is something we should research further to look into it. Truthfully, I think that history lies hidden in every hometown. It's just waiting to be discovered. And for me, I just became so passionate about finding this information about the two of them and really telling her story because I believe she's been forgotten in history that it just gave me an opportunity to just really dig deep. And it was like a treasure hunt, truthfully, finding the story. Really? Mm-hmm. How many years? How long did it take you? So it was about three and a half years. And wow. I worked on it every day. Oh, wow. So you dug into this. It was you were just, in the mud. I was. I was absolutely. I was in the archives. I was in a basement through <laughs> dusty old documents trying to find this one letter um, that would prove that George Washington had been in my hometown or what have you. And it was just... It was just one thing led to the one led to another. I found documents um, that hadn't been out of archives in hundreds of years, and I went to Harvard University's Houghton Library to say? look for this beautiful love letter. I brought it so you could take a look at it. This is a um, oh, this is a replica of it, but you see Washington's gorgeous handwriting, and this love letter in wow. history you got this on there? has sure always that. been kind of. You know, uh, it, it was curious Washington to me. Washington had a nice handwriting. Didn't he? He would have been very good in this business for any over here at Steiner <laughs> in the autograph business. He would have, and everybody's looking yeah. for his autograph, right? If you take a look at his writing, it, it was, um, it really takes you back because you just can't believe he would write so eloquently and beautifully and romantically. And so this love letter, and let me ask you what you think about this, actually, because this love letter has been something that historians have always questioned. And I'll give you the um, just the quick synopsis about it. But after this beautiful heiress, Mary Phillips, married another man, a few months later, George Washington wrote this love letter. And historians have long believed that Washington was in love with the woman to whom he wrote. So let me just explain just briefly. But George Washington sent this beautiful letter to a woman named Sally Fairfax. And in history, people have known that, oh, that's the woman that Washington was in love with. Sally was basically his best friend's wife. And that was curious to me. So months after Mary marries another man, George Washington sends his love letter to his best friend's wife, Sally Fairfax. That's odd. Exactly. More than that, I find out that when Washington sends this love letter to Sally, he also sends a letter to his really good friend. And it's sent in the same packet. And it arrives on the same day in the same house. So I thought, well, what did the friend say back? You know, if you're writing this love letter and, you know, professing your love for this woman in a letter, he's sending a letter to her husband, too. So I went back to see what the best friend said back. And and George William Fairfax says to Washington, don't worry about the house, George. I'm going to take care of everything you need. I'm going to build your stairs. I'm going to paint the house. I'm going to keep it exactly as you want it. They stayed friends for years after that. Now, what kind of a guy would decide, let me send a love letter to my really close friend's wife in the same packet and think that we're going to be able to keep our relationship? So are you saying that that letter was to be passed on and that maybe there was a little secret, something going on, that he couldn't go directly because of... It's possible, and I think that's what was really intriguing. Did he want that to be passed on, or was he at least you know, pouring his heart out into this letter wanting to be able to tell somebody his feelings and he sent it to this woman and in it he says the world has no business to know the object of my love you know he's talking not Sally I'm in love with you but more like Sally I'm in love with another with a woman and so historians have always said Washington was in love with his really good friend's wife and I think in a way it's left people wondering about Washington's character in a way sure and so I feel like that specifically and many other things which probably be not true reviewed and scrutinized because it's really been wrong and he just continues to be wronged in, in that way so I think that's just one piece of it but he still was in love with another woman any which way you want to look at it it I was mean, it w- he was in love with a woman yes, yeah he was sure. lo- now if Mary was here knowing everything you found out and you being a woman what would she say if she was here what do you think she would say? And we're just guessing, but you know, for all the documentation, what do you I think she think was thinking? I think that she had waited for Washington to come back for her, and he never came back. He didn't get back in time. And so she's 27, getting married. And um, I think she was, it, it was a very difficult time in her life. And more than that, I have to say, for Mary Phillips, she was completely wronged in history because in the end she was uh, named a traitor in the American Revolution. 
So here I am looking through documents, realizing that not only is this woman the first love of Washington, but in the American Revolution, she's named a traitor. So of course, I had to keep looking about th into that. And I think she was completely betrayed. I don't think she was a traitor at all. She was named a traitor along with two other women, three women named traitors in the American Revolution, the only three women who I believe owned any significant property. Because they wanted her property. <laughs> For sure. Uh, you own fifty thousand. She did. She not only lost her property, she lost everything she owned, possessions wise. She was condemned to death and banished from New York. She had to escape in order to survive. So we don't even know where she went. We do. We know where she went. I've spoken to her descendants as well. And where did she go? And uh, she left and went to England. Um, she had no choice. I don't. I don't oh think if goodness. she wanted to. If she wanted to. Survive. Now how'd you get a hold of the descendants? You're unbelievable. You you could be a private investigator, <laughs> man. Jeez. Well, I, was, I became so passionate about the project. Yeah. You know, I think once you start looking into these types of things, you uh, can't you meet, stop. You, meet, uh, you can't stop. And also, you meet people who know a little bit about it, and and a number of them were able to introduce me to people who then knew. Um, other people who knew other people, and you know how it goes, and I'm sure you've done this we're many times. We're doing this all the time in sports, you know, we're trying to dig in, you know, what happened, you know, back in the day, especially yeah. there's so much uh, interest back in the golden age of, of yeah. sports. When you spoke to descendants, what was the vibe there? What was the, what was the, what was the carry forward there? Anything sp specific? You know, I think that they hadn't realized, um, and I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth, but I don't think they realized how wronged their family was, because being named uh, enemies of the state, they lost everything, but w they were named under this really egregious law that was only passed in New York. It was the harshest law ever passed in colonial America, and it was called the Act of Attainder. A Alexander Hamilton fought fervently against it. In fact, it's yeah. a ban so in the U.S. Work? Constitution. Right, so it was it passed by a, a small group of officials, and they basically were judge, jury, and executioner, and the Act of Attainder says, if your name is on this list, you're guilty. And you can't prove your innocence. Oh boy. You can't go to court. There's no judicial recourse. And basically, if you're an enemy of the state, we're taking your possessions, your property, condemning you to death, and banishing you. And so that law was uh, the only one of its kind ever passed. Wow. <laughs> That's not good to get on that list, by the way. Exactly. But what's interesting for me is I've got to ask you a couple of things. One, where does this entrepreneur like this, you know, what else mindset come from? Uh, because you found an idea, then you acted on it. We're, we're talking, because a lot of people that watch this are sitting with ideas, and I want them to understand that you know, sitting with an idea and not doing anything is not good. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I think everyone has a book in them, and I think that they should really dig as deep as they need to in order to put it on paper. I think it all started, you know, I come from a family of immigrants, and uh, my family came over here um, by boat, actually, uh, and did whatever they had to do to give us a better life and so even when i'm driving you know in early in the morning overnights working early, uh, early yeah like 3 a.m <laughs> um i realized that uh if my you know my mom my dad could take a boat over here in the cold cross an ocean i could get up and do what i got to do let's talk about you for one second here i, don't, I will finish up on george washington a little bit but I just got to tell you, man, I, I mean, I live in Westchester. I see you on the weekends, and, and then before I know it, I see you on the you know, on local news. Nothing against, you know, Westchester 12, but, you know, local cable isn't, it's solid, but it's not the most glamorous, high paying. How do you work your way over, and did you ever think you worked your way over to major news, and not only weekend, you know, CBS in New York, but then now you're a weekend, now you're a weekday anchor, which is real. That's not like a lightweight job. That's the real thing. And, you know, that's significant, especially in a city like this. How do you get that progression and mother and waking up in the morning, keep it all together? I, I think that's important because that's a lot of people that watch this, you know, the, these uh, interviews I do. I, I don't want them to hesitate about, you know, well, I maybe want to have a family, this, that. Can you do all? Can you do both? And how do you do it? I have been doing it. And really, I think you have to set your mind to do whatever you really feel strongly about. I mean, what are you passionate about? What is driving you? And follow that and just go full steam ahead. And you say it all the time, right? Just go after it. Just do, do it. Just do it, yeah. absolutely. And so I had this wonderful opportunity 
that just fell out of the sky as I was working at uh, News 12 and I, I got a call um, from an agent and he basically took me from News 12 and put me in New York. What's crazy about Sandy Montauk, your agent, by the way, is he, what makes him smart is he listens to his wife, which we all know our wife's always right, which kills me. I'm just, every now and then I get a little <laughs> crumb of my wife being wrong. But, you know, your wives are just always right. But what's funny is, like, what I love about Sandy, what I tell people out there, is like, you know, when you get a feeling about something, tr- go after it. So Sandy just calls you randomly. He did. And it wasn't like you represented a lot of uh, newscasters. He was a sports guy. <laughs> John Madden and a whole bunch of different sports guys, uh, and Mont- now he's the Montag Group. But it's really a sports, more of a sports broadcasting group. Surprised that he called you, and then did you put? Was it more faith? Because you know you're leaving a nice, solid job to yeah. go do something that's a little bit beyond maybe oh, what you were thinking, or. Yeah, it was difficult to do that. You know, a lot of people, I think, make those decisions. You know, you're in a very uh, comfortable setting. I was in my home county, and I had a a really lovely job um, being able to do what I had always set out to do, be a journalist. And to take that step was a big step. Did you have a mentor there that helped you when you made that transition to show you how to do that level of news? Absolutely. I think everybody needs one of those folks. In fact, you know what I think? I think that... The people that are around you who people consider competition are not competition. Those are the people you should network with. I mean, I think people should be networking with the people that are sitting right next to them. You know, everybody's thinking I need to go out and get some, like, high, you know, somebody else, somebody else. I got to go get somebody bigger. This, I think, is the people right around you that are going to help you make that next step. I love that. And that was really helpful to me. I mean, I had some great folks at uh, Channel 2 who took me in and really helped me. I mean, Dana Tyler, who you know, is an anchor there, and she has helped yeah. me so much throughout my years there. How's your day work, though? Explain that to me, <laughs> because I know it's glamorous to be on TV, but I know I'm up early, and you're already on. Like, how, wh- How's your day work? Like, so tell me what you think about your alarm going off at 2.30 a.m. That's insane <laughs> so that's what time it goes off you start at 2 30 a.m i get up yeah the alarm goes off at 2 30 and i'm at the station by 3 30. oh and you gotta so be there at three and what time do you go on the air 4 30 a.m oh wow yeah yeah so and we're two on two and a half hours straight we're doing local new york news and we are live and um going strong you know because news breaks all the time in yes. New York so you have to be ready I mean there is no you know people get up and hit snooze there's just no hit and snooze in the morning you're hitting traffic <laughs> there's no one it's on the crazy. road it, well, what's great is that when I see somebody else on the road I'm like oh thank goodness somebody else is up at this time with me so you're at you, you, at what time are you leaving work so I work the new the morning show and then I'm on the noon show as well and I you know what's wonderful about working these types of shifts is you're home and the light, you know, the sun's still shining and you can still go. And so you're home probably around well, 1.32 in the yeah, afternoon. Yeah, something like Kids that. Kids are getting home from school. That's right. So what time do you got to go to bed to wake up at 2.30? <laughs> I, you know, I'm one of those people that doesn't really go to bed that early. I maybe go to bed about, I don't know, 9, 9.30. Okay. Yeah, so I, yeah. I sleep like five hours a night. So you're good at five hours. I'm not, I'm not great. That's coming, that's coming to an end soon, though, I'm by not, the way. I'm not, it's not great. In my, my new book, I'm going to outline that. that five, five, but it could be good for you, but generally six is like the minimum. I think you're absolutely right about that. I yeah. think I could absolutely use six. And then when the weekend comes, I sort of um, live like the rest of the world, you know. I you can jump right at, back into yep, it? Mm-hmm. Really? I stay up late at, on Friday nights and maybe get a little double espresso <laughs> and go strong. And then I get up at every, you know, the normal times that everybody's getting up on the weekends. And so I've sort of worked it into the in this way because trying it the other way, which I did try, I was missing out on life. And I just didn't want to have to do that. Because when you do the 11 o'clock, I tell people all the time, like, I think one of the hardest gigs because you're doing 6 and 11, you got to be working the afternoon, you don't get home until late, by the time you wake up, it's it's a tough shift. I was on that schedule too. You know, I think people don't really think about it, but in the news business, we're usually on when everybody's home, so we're doing the shifts that are early in the morning or late at night or the weekends, and so I think you have to be ready for that when you go into this business. But you went to school for this, Syracuse University, Newhouse. Were you prepared for this? Did Syracuse help you prepare? Was that the right? So my feeling, and and I've always believed that in life, 
instead of worrying, be prepared. And so I've spent all of my years and all of my days as much as I possibly can being prepared for the next step. And so absolutely Newhouse was so important in my life and really gave me the tools to get started, to get the first job, to you know get my foot in the door. And it was essential. I, I don't think I would be where I am if I that's, wasn't at Newhouse. It's just amazing. Back to your book for a minute. First of all, we get in this book on Amazon. Anywhere you'd this? like. Where, where's your preference stuff? I find By the way, this is a great Mother's Day gift or just a great <laughs> romance book for your wife. The pro- my problem is that I'm not counting on a lot of men to read. I'm trying to learn to read more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, my wife's reading like a book a week. Really? Well, I think what you would like about this book is you see George Washington on the precipice of greatness. You understand his inspirations, his motivations. And I think you see life through his lens that you probably never thought you would see of George Washington. And and he's quite remarkable in that he survives every deadly disease. I mean, he survives getting shot twice in the hat, four times in the in the coat. What he what he gets through, no one else should have been able to. And he basically says that he believes, you know, he was destiny was guiding him throughout his life that there was this direction of providence that so was, was divine intervention that's what he he yeah. writes about quite often so you were taken about by him you're a fan i really uh, was um co- completely caught up in his life and i i c- couldn't believe the stories i was reading honestly um and i wondered why i never heard them before you got me intrigued i'm not gonna <laughs> lie First of all, pick this up on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. It's a great book. How do we get a hold of you if you have any comments on the book? Are you like a Facebook person? Or? Absolutely, anywhere you'd like. I'm all over social media, Facebook. Are you getting Instagram, into a lot of dialogue Twitter. about this? Are people coming oh, yes, at you? Yes, absolutely. Because I, I could see this. I, I know it sounds crazy, but I really see this as a movie. Oh, that would can, be amazing. Can you see this? I, well, I, that would be something. It's I, always I, the I, sleeper. You know, it's the <laughs> early morning newscaster is now <laughs> the executive producer of the movie. But it would make for good. Big screen, no? Uh, well, I think his story is pretty remarkable in his 20s, and her story being that she's been forgotten in history, I think there's there's, there's definitely did you, um, drama. Did you like the process of putting a book like this together? Would you do it again? I wanted to ask you what you thought, because you've written three books, and they're all phenomenal, and I put so much of my heart into it, and it was like every day I was just uh, in the middle of the research and the writing, and... I would love to do it again. I just have to be ready mentally and uh, It's a prepared. labor of love. Like it my second book is. I wrote just because if another person walked up to me and said, well, how'd you get started? What's the first thing you collected? Mm-hmm. Which was basically what you did when you walked in my office. And I, it's cool, but I mean, I'm like, oh God, it's such a well, long story. <laughs> and I'm like, here's the book. It, you know, it really outlines it because it is an odd story. But I, the third book is the book I'm nervous about because that's the book that I really, my intent was really to help people. And it was a book that I was extremely transparent that I feel like if you're in your 40s, you got to read this because it's so many people, they wake up, you're 50, and you don't see it coming. You're blindsided uh, about what to do. And now that we're all living a little longer. So when I get the emails, which I ran, I I do, uh, even going back to the first book, it's probably my favorite thing in the day. You know, I read your book and thank you or got this one little nugget. You know, I leave my my cell phone on my date night and it's changed my relationship with my wife or my husband. Like, those little nuggets. And it's funny. It's always the odd thing about in the book. Mm. You think that what people are going to remember, but then it's the odd little thing in the book that it's people will bring up. It's true. I know. Something that yeah. I would never have thought, like a little anecdote that I talked about or like something that they were eating or drinking. It was really neat, actually, doing the research about the 1700s in New York because I didn't know anything. So and, I, and, no, and a lot of people don't talk about exactly. it. Exactly. So this, I, I had to go back to like the old books. Um, so this, this was a book, bo- this was a cookbook written in the 1700s to understand like, well, what were they eating? I mean, I, I had no idea were they even having breakfast. What was were there? they eating? So there are great recipes in here. First of all, ketchup is in this book from the 1700s 20 year ketchup <laughs> they would make foods that would like <laughs> last as long as possible but like there's tipsy cake there's like uh the beautiful oyster recipes there's a beautiful like uh pretty almond pudding tipsy cake and all types of cocktails that they were tipsy drinking cake. too tipsy like cake that. so it was really what fun. intrigues me in this book and like where i see the movie going is how mary got out of the country and how they took our land away, and then it's, and then how they kind of tortured George by sending him all these different directions. Like, 
that make that's good that's a good big screen i think that you know? um he is these times in his life he's historians have always called him like raw rude you know immature as he was like you know writing these nasty letters to his commanders when you put mary phillips into the narrative you completely understand why Washington is acting the way he is. He's like reasonable and rational. You know what's really interesting? And I'm sure you've seen the musical Hamilton. Yes. These are the events leading up to Hamilton involving George Washington. And I think that what people will see is a Washington that just is so much more than the guy you see on the dollar bill. Well, I'm taking action and I'm not a name dropper, but I happen to see Steven Spielberg at the Yankee game this uh, this summer, and he's a Yankee fan, and I sent him a bunch of stuff. This, uh, you know, just to follow up with him. I want him to have some collectibles. I'm definitely sending him a copy of this oh, book, just because like, you never know. That's amazing. You know, my friend was like an assistant producer for him, like production assistant okay. out of college. So I used to go and hang out in his office. <laughs> you know, you know, just. It's fascinating. Yeah, you know, just <laughs> here we are, like we're in Steven's <laughs> office, we're in his movie theater. What? And I learned a few things from Stephen, though. Mm-hmm. But believe it or not, never, never met him till over the summer. But like one of the things was he was a gift giver, twelve months a year. So I was like, I, I, Brad, what is this room? He goes, he buys gifts all year round. If you see something he likes that you think may be a good gift for someone, he buys it. This way, he has something for the people he loves and, and cares about always. So I always pick that up. Like with my wife, I never have to go worry about shopping for my wife. I'm, I'm a gift buyer for my wife all year round. For my kids all year round. And why, why go hunt down a Valentine's Day or birthday? I'm looking always. I thought that'd be cool. My wife would love that. You know, but my son would love that. Really? And I keep a little stock of <laughs> great gifts for the people that are important to me. I learned that from Steven. So I went to see him, and I went over that little story with him. And he kind of got a kick out of that. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Because I was in the Amblin kitchen. I was in his office. But anyway, I'm sending him this book. Oh, I still I appreciate just think there's like a big screen thing. And I love, listen, we talk about ideas on this show. And some people have really done amazing, like some of the people that have been on, and I'm hoping this is like one of them. Not that you're not doing well, but this, your life's great, and I'm happy for you, and I love watching the progression. I really So I'm really happy that. for you on that. Um, if you want to get a hold of Mary, go to her Facebook page. She's your, your Yeah, Mary Calvi is right there, yeah. And uh, you'll see her every morning on CBS New York if you're lucky enough to get that channel. And uh, who knows what's next? Is there what's next? Well, I I really love what I do, and being a journalist in New York is just a dream come true, honestly, and has been such an amazing opportunity, and the folks over there have been so wonderful to me, so I'm really happy there, and having had the opportunity to take this journey and and become an author has been more than I could have ever imagined. You like a private eye. I mean, this is, I I mean, I've, I've done a few books, and I put a lot into them, but this is extensive. It's good for you. I really hope that yeah. what will come out of this is further research about this time in history and to really take a closer look at this possible deception against Washington and also this betrayal of Mary Phillips. And I think there's more to tell. I think there are more documents to find. And we'll see what they're, where the story takes us. All right, Mary. Nice to see you. Nice Pleasure. To see you. Thank okay, everybody. We'll see you soon. Love hearing from you. Any feedback? Love to hear from you. How how great is this story? It's unbelievable.